Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. I think we will just get started for the sake of time. Um, I will let you know that this panel is being recorded and we will post the recording of it after the fact on, uh, and we'll send that link to everybody so you can review it if you so choose. Um, I will ask, of course, that you please remain muted throughout the discussion. If you do have questions that come up throughout the discussion, I encourage you to leave them in the chat. I think that will be the easiest and we will have some time at the end of the conversation that we will save for um, audience questions that come up during the panel. We also have uh, collected the questions that some of you left in your registration form and we'll also be uh, addressing some of those towards the end as well. So before I begin, I would just like to take a moment to say that the Vancouver Bach Choir would like to recognize that we are living and creating art in the historic home of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations peoples. I also would encourage you, wherever you are joining us from today, to take a moment to acknowledge the lands that you are currently on. And uh, if you'd like, you can please feel free to type them in the chat so that we know where everyone is from. So my name is Nina Horvath, and I am the executive director for the Vancouver Bach Choir. For myself, I am a first generation settler with my family arriving to this land from Slovakia, and I grew up on the lands of the Okanagan, Sinixt, and Ktenaxa people, or as I grew up knowing it, Rossland, BC. And today I also live in Vancouver, which is Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh land. I would like to welcome all of you here to this discussion about decolonizing choirs. Now I know for myself personally, this has been a very intimidating concept to engage with, but as I have done so over the past year, it has become less and less so as I've had the opportunity to learn from folks like the people on this panel. My hope is that by the end of this discussion, you also will feel encouraged to continue your own journey and engagement with this topic and to move forward into this with a willingness to learn from others and to not be afraid to make mistakes, but to just keep moving forward. And again, as I said, we encourage questions. This is a safe space to ask them. And if you would like, just write them in the chat. So if they come into your mind, you don't forget about them. And we will try and get to them at the end. And just before I introduce our panelists, I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the support of uh, Metro Vancouver in making this panel possible. Now on to our panelists, I am going to let them introduce themselves and tell you a bit about themselves. So I'm going to uh, start with Elaine, if she'd like to say hi. Thank you, Nina. Hello, everyone. I'm Elaine Choi, based in Toronto, uh, Canada right now. I was born and raised in Hong Kong, and I was immigrating uh, to the, with my family to Canada in my late teens. I was trained in Western art music at a very young age in piano and violin but I have a personal interest in Chinese orchestral music and also contemporary choral repertoire uh, written by Chinese composers. And uh, I went on to finish my dissertation in a conductor's guide to Mandarin lyric diction. And after that started a choir called Babel with a mission to bridge cultures and discover more music by Chinese composers. So hello everyone. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, I'm just going to go around my screen. So Melissa is next. Hello. Good evening, everyone. I'm grateful to Nina and the Vancouver Bach Choirs for inviting me to speak to you today and very proud to be among such fantastic colleagues of the choral art. I'm speaking to you on Treaty 4 land, the ancestral territories of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Mischief First Nations. Um, I am the Assistant Director of Choral Music at the University of Regina in Regina, Saskatchewan, part of the Prairies, and choral music has always been a part of my life and a way of life for me. My parents are from the West Indies. My father's side has roots in Jamaica, 
and my mother's heritage is from the island of Barbados. Um, but both my parents spent the majority of their formative years in England. And I believe that their influence and perspectives and lived experiences have had a profound uh, influence on the way that I identify myself and see the world. I was born in Kitimat, British Columbia, but around the age of one, my parents moved to Regina and uh, I was fortunate to have family support in uh, doing music lessons uh, my whole entire life. Music was not a hobby, but it really was a lifestyle. And uh, as a child, I remember participating in our band programs, our church, our uh, community choral programs, music festivals, you, you name it, we did it. And uh, I guess you could say we were privileged when it came to music. Um, but as an undergrad uh, is when I began to explore uh, the ways of becoming a conductor. And uh, I finished my degree here at the University of Regina went on to do a master's at the University of Western Ontario. Uh, very fortunate to study with Dr. Victoria Meredith there and, uh, and it was able to complete my doctorate at the University of Toronto uh, with Dr. Hilary Appelstadt. Um, my thoughts on I and ideas about access, diversity, equity and inclusion, decolonization was heightened uh, during the horrific killing of George Floyd this past May. The world is reminded that racism and biases, uh, they are still alive and well throughout the world. And I sincerely believe that as a choral artist, educator, a woman, daughter, sister, person of color, it is my responsibility to amplify the voice of those whose voices need to be heard. Um, I'm really grateful, I must say that when I first began to get requests to speak on this topic, I was hesitant. By nature, I am a quiet personality and speaking out about issues of diversity in regards to the realities of uh, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color in Canada was private and uh, out of my comfort zone. Uh, but I soon understood that having this discussion, these conversations, expressing ideas, telling my story was not about being comfortable. I understood that it was part of my duty to bring awareness and information with grace and empathy to those who sincerely desire the best for people. So I do not speak for all people who look like me, but I'm grateful to engage in meaningful conversation this evening. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, let's move on to Andrew, please. Um, Tansi, Ani, um, my name is Andrew, and again, I would express that like, it's an honor to be part of this converse, important conversation. Um, I'm based in Toronto, but I'm originally from Treaty 1 territory in Winnipeg. Um, I'm a 60 scooper, uh, meaning that I was taken away from my blood when I was six months old. My blood, free blood, originally comes from Fisher River, the First Nation in northern, northwestern Manitoba. Um, I have never met my blood mother was Cree. Um, I don't know anything about my father. So, um, but I was lucky enough to go into a wonderful musical and loving family. Amongst, uh, unlike so many of my other colleagues in my blood who went into foster homes and foster homes. So um, because of my family who adoptive family ex ex exposed me to music, um, it's been a lifelong journey and a great love of, of particularly choral music. I'm a composer based here in Toronto. Um, I do a lot of collaborations with Indigenous artists. I'm the artistic director and founder of Camerata Nova in Winnipeg that I started in 1997. Um, it's been a long journey as we approach our 25th anniversary. Um, so I do a lot of uh, works, thematic concerts based on Indigenous perspectives and ideas and uh, um, stories, storytelling. Um, some of them are quite harsh, um, but at the same time, uh, I don't, as Melissa said, I don't speak for all Indigenous artists or people. So I have a perspective that I, pretty unique in some ways. Um, I can talk about this later in terms of being colonized at a young age. I did not know my language or my blood um, or I, actually my true identity until I was in my 20s. Um, I'm like Melissa was saying, I'm seeing at, at first very uh, unsure of whether I wanted to chime in on 
on this past year, so many panels, so many talks about diversity and decolonization and, um, and representing the marginal, uh, marginalized uh, peoples in this country, and there's so many of them. But I think through the arts and choral music in particular, that we have an opportunity to sort of address these issues, even if we're not BIPOC or indigenous or people of color. Um, we have, you know, when we can get back to where we want to be in terms of performing and uh, reaching out to our communities and, and, and um, our so-called audiences, is that we are using this time to talk about these important issues that we're bringing to the table our experiences of, of being um, BIPOC or uh, perspectives that are outside of the settler colonial uh, foundation of Canada. Um, this is a very, um, this is a very important time right now. Um, speaking as an Indigenous person, Indigenous people weren't allowed to vote until the early 60s. Um, and we took our, had our language and our medicines and our sacred drums and sacred instruments um, and ceremonies and rituals taken away from us. So um, I think that right now, in terms of speaking on behalf of myself, is that this is a very important discussion. Um, I'm honored to be with uh, Elaine and Melissa and Hussein um, as part of this greater discussion because I'm also learning on a daily basis what it means, one, to be an Indigenous person, an artist, what it means to be a composer, what it means to be part of the choral community, um, and what it means, what it means and, and my hope is that uh, the alliances that we have with each other are only the, is the way that's going to get us to a place where we, we can be an equal footing and we can make music again, but with respect, with respect and um, great, you know, in terms of the protocols involved and learning from each other. That's what I'm really hoping that tonight will spark that fire. So Chimigwitz for having me here. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Andrew. And last, but of course not least, Hussein. Good evening, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'm uh, very grateful to be here as well. Thank you so much, uh, Nina and your entire team for putting this uh, panel together. And to be here with you, Elaine, Melissa and Andrew, it means a lot. And I'm very humbled to be able to learn with and, and share uh, ideas with you all today. Um, my relationship with the term decolonial began out of necessity, I think, to create a sense of belonging in the world as a response to racism and being othered. Um, I never really got to, and I still wouldn't say that I fully understand that word because I think there are so many nuances to it. Um, my ancestors are South Asian from India. I'm third generation uh, African born in Nairobi, Kenya. And I was raised in Alberta, lived in BC, and now I live in Toronto. I work as a choral conductor, a vocal facilitator, educator, a vocalist, and composer, mostly in choral music. And I also sing traditional devotional poems from the Shia Ismaili Muslim tradition, an esoteric branch of Islam that sees a deep connection between material and spiritual worlds, and in which social justice and improving the quality of life of others is wrapped up in the intellectual and spiritual approach. Um, I was involved in music growing up in band, choir, private accordion lessons, and uh, later also uh, furthered my studies in choral music. Music has always been a safe place and a place to harmonize my voice with others. It's been a haven. Um, it was, it was, and like you, Melissa, it's been a way of seeing the world. It's been a way of life for me. Um, and this was really important living in Alberta where I faced a lot of racism and our family did as well. This racism is what made me question my role in society, my role in music, how music could shift perspectives, how music could be an inclusive space, especially in choral settings where I, very early on noticed that there weren't people who looked like me in choir. There wasn't music that I felt represented myself as a subject of my own story, even though choir directors might say, hey, we performed an Indian song by uh, Ethan Sperry. And I would look at them and say, well, I don't know that. I grew up in Canada and I'm a hundred years separated from India. So, you know, how would I fit in and what would be my voice in contributing to that? 
Um, my family and my faith taught me to be strong in our ethical foundations and to be proud of our cultural traditions. I'm so grateful for them uh, for reminding me constantly that this connection allowed me to think outside the box and to find ways to participate proactively. And it pushed me to figure out how to create musical conditions for myself and others in my community so they could find their voice in a Western, in a Western context. Um, and this is where I started thinking about uh, conducting Ismaili choirs, composing and working with intercultural music as counterpoints, responses to this, uh, this question I had. So for me, this search in, in, in uh, offering a co contrapuntal response has been a, an a intellectual quest, uh, answering these questions how, of how I can uh, participate more fully and help others to be the same. Um, facing racism then opened the door of me asking these questions of how I really fit into the choral environment. Um, this has naturally involved in my work um, in facilitating co-creation, composition, um, collaborating with other singers, and hopefully trying to figure out how we can together learn from each other and grow and build and share tools that we can hear and respond with each other and in how we understand and hear ourselves in the world. I'm currently happy to be a doctoral candidate at the University of Toronto in music education under the supervision of Dr. Laurie Ann Doloff. I see you there. Hi, Dr. Doloff. It's been a great journey and I hope that um, that learning will continue and that we today can uh, also offer some ideas just to share. And, like everybody else, I don't represent all of the Muslim community or all of the South Asian community, but just to share some of my narratives and stories that have helped me find peace and come to terms with, uh, with how I can become uh, more full, fully human in the world. Thank you, Hussein, and welcome to all four of our panelists. So we will move along to, I mean, what, is the main question here, which is what is decolonizing? So the panelists and I had a meeting last week and I think it was Melissa who said, you know, I always like to just start from the dictionary definition and kind of go from there. And so I thought, oh, yeah, you know, that's a good idea. And I mean, if you look up decolonizing in the dictionary, it has, it's essentially says to free from colonial status. So, Great, that's it, We're that's the panel, we're good, right? So obviously, it's much more complex for us than that. Um, a slightly more expanded definition here that I took from the University of Warwick is that it refers to the undoing of colonial rule, but has taken on a wider meaning to free the minds from colonial ideology, and in such can serve as a metaphor for those wanting to critique positions of power and dominant culture which again is still a pretty packed statement. And I think what all of our panelists have found, what I have found is that there are many, many nuances of meaning and many different uh, levels of relationship or interaction with this term and how we all feel about it. So with that in mind, I'd like to turn it over to our panelists to chat about this in terms of like, how do you define this for yourself? Do you even like this word? Do you not like it? you know, and what is your relationship with it been and how have you sort of incorporated that into your own practice? So I'm not sure if anyone in particular wants to jump right in. Um, I'm happy to, um, sure. because it is humbling and nerve wracking and unsettling um, to talk about this word and it's uncomfortable, but it's good that we're really having this conversation and sharing this journey with all of you today. So the word decolonization, you know, my connection to this word continues to evolve, and especially within the last couple of weeks. And to be honest, we had a pre-meeting uh, last week, and my understanding of that word has changed since our first pre-meeting as well. And it will continue to evolve as I um, study more and learn more and reflect and listen and learn. My first impression of this word is one that is quite naive, and I 
have to admit that, uh, because right away I think of myself as the Hong Konger. And the word decolonization means so differently, uh, whether you're in Canada and US, in Hong Kong, and especially in Hong Kong right now. And, and that was the first uh, thought that I have was with the prefix of D removing something, but at the same time, so much of my formative years and my education, my music education, my understanding of everything was brought up in a colony. What does that mean? So that brought me a lot of questions and a lot of unsettling feeling and really just coming to terms that, okay, Elaine, you can't look at it at this end. Let's move into your different hats. Just like all conductors, we wear many different hats and our identities, we're merging identities. Um, so let's look at it as, me as a Canadian and as a first generation immigrant Canadian, I came to Canada in my late teens and it took a while to convince myself to love this new place. My family was the one who made the decision uh, to come to Canada, just like a lot of families like um, like myself, like my, my students, for example. And uh, but I have to say my first couple of years in Canada, I was warmly welcomed. I came from a somewhat monoculture place to a multicultural place. Uh, I was also very privileged to be in the greater Toronto area. So my most of my experiences are quite positive. There are a couple of racist experiences here and there, but majority of my experiences were very positive. And then I realized that I was very much living in a blissful bubble, a shiny rainbow uh, that I was so warmly welcomed in Canada. But I realized that these loveliness and, the, and this warm cuddle of a feeling mask the problem that is beneath the service. And coming to Canada at the age I was, I was pretty soon, I went to University of Toronto for my undergraduate study in music education. And at that time, um, talking about the history of Canada or the uh, settler colonial state of Canada or Indigenous study was nothing. We, we didn't really do any of them. We went to school for music. We learned about our instruments. We learned about what to teach. I love my time there, don't get me wrong. Um, but I realized that it will be up to myself to learn it. It will be my individual independence to get to know more about what it means to be decolonizing, what it means to learn about the Indigenous studies and, and the community. So if you ask me now, what does, how does the work connect with me is, I still need to know a lot more. I don't know enough yet, um, but what I'm hoping to do today to share with you is maybe some relatable um, situation or lived experience that some of your students might be in as well. Um, I teach at the University of Toronto with a choir that has a lot of foreign students that reminded of myself. Um, at that age, and if we don't talk about this, and we if we don't cultivate an environment in our choir in our classroom to talk about this, they they would be left on their own to be finding out about what decolonization is. So I'm just like my fellow panelists here, uh, Melissa Hussein and Andrew, is completely out of my comfort zone to be here. But yet again, I've, I'm so grateful to share this journey and to talk about this, because I really hope that this is the, the beginning for me. I'm a newcomer into this discussion, and I want to admit that. Um, and I hope that this will continue to um, have conversations about it. And I've had so many conversations in the last month on this topic and i'm grateful for my colleague and my friends to cultivate that openness in educating myself and i hope um yeah i hope we all do that as well with my our students or with choristers or with our friends and families my parents they don't know anything about this i have to talk to them about it so really just cultivating that openness so it's a long answer to not really an answer <laughs> sorry <laughs> Non-answers count as answers as well. <laughs> Feel free, any of panelists, if you want to chime in. Yeah, 
I, I really appreciate everything that uh, Elaine just said. And uh, I think it's really important that, you know, when, when we're talking about these issues and, and I, I have to uh, also say to myself, look at ourselves and see how are we positioned and where are we positioned. Um, so uh, when I look at this decolonization, yes, I, I do look to the dictionary, I, I look to the scholars and I look to people who have spent their lives and, and you know, their time researching, thinking about this uh, topic and uh, just my, my, my little research that I did in preparation for tonight, meaning to remove colonial power, the dominant power from a colonized state, province, territory, or land. Uh, I found this uh, lovely website uh, that helped, helped me kind of contextualize everything a little bit smoother. This website is hosted by Queen's University Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, where it says, this means that Western European derived ways of being, believing, knowing, and doing are implicitly or explicitly presented as a standard or norm and other ways of being, knowing, and doing are implicitly or explicitly presented as other, alternative, or less worthy. So when I see that, I, I have to say to myself, and I think this is something that I have always known for myself, but now I'm, I'm making an intentional effort uh, to be open, to talk about this, to position myself in the realm of the world and what is going on and what, what must I do? I have to do away with the idea that Western European ways of thinking, believing are the standard and the norm and that other ways are substandard. And I think uh, I'm okay to say as choral artists, we have done that. Um, we have said that, you know, the great bees, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms uh, are at the top and everything else is sort of at the bottom. And now is the time to put in the time to do the work, to do the research, and to recognize that there are other greats in other cultures. And uh, we want to begin to see how can we incorporate that into our teaching. Uh, and not to, uh, I don't think in my personal opinion that we should do away with uh, the, the Bach, the Beethoven, the Brahms. Uh, I don't think that we should cancel that, but we need to find a way to make um, music of all cultures equal. Uh, when we begin to look at our programs for the following years or for our schools, for our classrooms, we need to consider the music of all cultures the same way that we consider the music of our Western European um, music. Uh, so I, I think for me, uh, this is a journey that now I'm more intentional about uh, the way that I view my choir, that I, the way that I view myself, that's where it starts. It really begins with me. Uh, and then the way that I can connect to those um, that, are, that are in my ensembles and be a better teacher and ultimately a better world citizen. That, that's what really this, this is for me. Absolutely, thanks. Andrew, I saw you on mute a little earlier if you had something to say there. Um, yeah, it's so great in terms of listening to these perspectives and um, the word decolonizing actually, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with for a while now um, because I feel it's a colonial word in itself. I, in terms of how I would approach it as the word transformation, personally speaking, is that the idea of how we're going to transform from this uh, colonial system that we've been brought up with, you know, as it's been mentioned in the, by Elaine and Melissa, it's like the Western Eurocentric approach to so-called classical music making um, is very complex. And the way that it's approached and has been approached certainly for the last couple of centuries um, is very hierarchical. It's very, very uh, difficult to, and especially in a so-called democracy to accept that the hierarchy of music making that in, in you know in the, especially in the last century with recordings and uh, tv and films and things like that i find it difficult to sort of when i go up north 
uh, I worked for the Music Alive program for the National Arts Center, and they hire a bunch of musicians to go up north and to do outreach for, for communities that don't have um, don't have music programs. And it's mostly all, all of North that don't really have music programs, particularly for Indigenous students. Um, and it's not my job to go up there to teach them about Mozart and Bach and you know what have you. It's 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 really actually not part of the radar. My job is to help them create and to express themselves through you know singing and music. Um, but I feel this country has really failed its marginalized um, uh, peoples. Um, and I think that I've said it many times, governments are the last people to be able to, or, or institutions to be able to really make the changes we want to see in this country. They're only on four-year mandates. And um, I feel that it's the arts. Um, and because I'm a choral person and an orchestral person, I feel that there's a slight change in, on the horizon, more so in the choral world than I feel in the orchestral world, um, to bring awareness to these issues. Because I'm a choral, I write for choir and, and, and for choral music, that I feel comfortable within that zone. And I feel that there are more choral directors out there that are, that are getting this idea of reaching out to their local communities if they're going to, to approach this idea of of um, bringing awareness to indigenous music. I don't write indigenous music, I write classical music. My background is early music, um, particularly late Renaissance music. So um, you can't get, you know, in some ways you could think you can't get further from so-called indigenous music than music from uh, Lassus or William Byrd or Palestrina. But in many ways, we can find ways to make connections with music, you know, European music. If we lose this idea of the higher art, the hierarchy and a little bit of sort of this like built-in um, supremacy that Eurocentric music brings to the table. Um, you know, I went to university and I was taught that the, you know, the tonality of the, of the major and minor scales is of the superior way of, of expressing ourselves, which is actually actually when you think about it ridiculous because most of the world doesn't speak in that musical language. Um, there's a wonderful uh, autobiography by Buffy St. Marie that came out a couple of years ago. And she's actually quite an historian. She knows her European history. And she talked about um, that Europeans, particularly like, you know, when you go back to the medieval age, had a large amount of experience decolonizing uh, their own, call, sorry, colonizing their own people, whether it was the church or it was the royal court. So by the time they got to Turtle Island, North America and Africa and South America, they were quite experienced with colonizing peoples and oppressing them. So it isn't something just new that, you know, the uh, Columbus or, you know, the pilgrims have arrived on, on Turtle Island or South America and suddenly just bam, they're oppressing people. They had quite you know, centuries of experience with this. So it's, it's difficult uh, as an amateur historian, my perspective, it's, di it's difficult to accept that there, um, there are, classes of music making and institutions in the way that we express ourselves. Singing is singing in my, in my world. And I too do not want to get, you know, to wipe the slate clean and get rid of the classical canon of Bach, Beethoven, and what have you. Um, uh, I feel that if we are able to open ourselves, our institutions and our communities up to be able to accept all peoples that want to learn or want to experience to uh, you know, to use this word decolonizing the experience of going to a concert, um, whether it's Tafel music or Toronto Symphony or the COC, I'm just using that reference because I'm in Toronto, is to make it acceptable for everyone, both financial and cultural and um, social, socially, to be, to be able to accept all peoples to, to experience the joy of, of Bach um, or Avril Pert or, you know, or Penderecki, just to be able to let you know, that's a start to make it accessible. Um, and I think that there's a slight change in this last year, because now we're almost into a year of this uh, COVID, is that finally the, finally, the experiences of all us being isolated and locked down, are, you know, and with the technology like Zoom and, and emails and what have you, we're, we're actually having these important discussions. But as an Indigenous person and knowing the history of the last hundred and uh, you know, 54, 153 years, is that Indigenous people have long experiences with, uh, um, uh, you know, like uh, diseases um, and uh, repression and uh, genocide in many ways. So 
you know, in terms of like, I, I sympathize with sort of what the, the greater population of, of, of uh, the world is sort of seeing injustices, but these injustices have been going on for quite some time. Um, and I'm glad to sort of see that, you know, in the arts world in particular, that we are looking into ourselves and how do we, you know, how are we going to be able to reach out to our communities? You know, I always feel this country has failed the indigenous people in the biggest terms because we don't have clean drinking water in our northern communities. If we can build pipelines of oil um, across, th you know, thousands and thousands of kilometers, why can't we build pipelines of clean water? Um, and the fact that there are many people that come to this country that don't know the history of, uh, of residential schools and uh, oppression um, from, through no fault of their own, because that's the up to the education system and being a so-called citizen of this country, um, you know, it, it, they don't know that history um, of the indigenous people. They don't, and it's not, again, it's not their fault. Um, because I, I remember hearing one person say at one time, it was like, well, they live up in Northern Canada. There's so much water up there. Why, how come they don't have clean drinking water? Well, they don't know about the mining, um, the mercury poisoning, um, and, and of these, and, and the fact that they were so-called reserves were actually plots of land where the government deemed the most unworthy place to farm or to live, um, and to take a people, especially nomadic in the plains, the Cree and the Ojibwe and the Dene, um, the Blackfoot, who were, you know, were nomadic in, in a lot of ways, that to suddenly take, uh, uh, you know, people like that had millennia of experience of hunting and, 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 and utilizing the land and being stewards of the land to be put in a, on a plot of land. It's, it's, it's a huge criminal injustice, culturally speaking, and that's basically what this country is built on. However, I'm not a militant person per se. Um, I'm also passionate about expressing that to, to, to people. Um, again, going back to my coal background, I do a lot of collaborations with indigenous people and I'm seeing more and more one uh, young indigenous artists that are going to school and are being featured. Um, we know the famous ones, Jeremy Dutcher, Tanya Tagak, Tribe Called Red, um, what have you, but there are so many more coming up the pipeline that are really, um, that are really deserve a voice, particularly in our coral community. And I'm seeing hope uh, for the first time, I'm seeing recognition and I'm seeing non-Indigenous um, conductors particularly, because I work with a lot of them, and many of them are on, on this Zoom right now, that are being aware. And the most important, I think, tool that we have in our box is our listening skills, is to listen. I've, you know, in the past, when I first started doing Indigenous, uh, um, indigenous perspectives in my music, um, I got hired a lot. But as soon, you could tell right away, as soon as you're in that first meeting, they, it's, it's their ideas. It's the non-Indigenous people's ideas. Like, I want, uh, I want the sound of eagles, or I want powwow drums in this. And I want, you know, you know let's talk about, you know, um, you know, like, the, you know, that sitting bowl or whatever. It's like sitting bowls, like, that's, that's not even regional. It's ridiculous. But that's maybe not even their fault. I'm not mad at these people. I just feel a lot of it is misinformation and their own per perspectives of either people of color or, uh, you know, Indigenous people and the culture um, and the rituals and what have you. I'm not that person. I'm Andrew Balfour that writes music, you know, that I'm influenced by pair than I mentioned before early music. Um, but I still want to bring awareness to things like murdered and missing women and residential schools um, and clean drinking water and the social injustices that are happening. You know, this is this this year again has been a very frustrating year, um, for, you know, for, for all people of the color and whether it's George Floyd, um, or a poor woman that got, you know, a trailer hitch thrown in her stomach from some Yahoo and died, or some woman that's in a hospital and being, you know, given racist comments while she's dying. Like, that's infuriating. How can I, how can I do that? I, I can go in the street and protest, but I think myself, I want to write music about that. And I've been given the opportunity by certain different choirs across this country to express that. And for that, those are alliances that are important. I know there's many allies on this Zoom right now. Um, both that I've met and potentially um, I, I, I will want to work with. But we have a lot of work to do um, and we have a lot of listening and to learn and collaborate. Um, but, you know, in terms of like as an Indigenous artist, um, I'm lucky I'm working right now through all of this and I'm, I'm making a lot of contacts. But uh, I also, you know, sometimes when I walk downtown or through the park, I see people in tents. And uh, that's not good in a first world country.
So I, I just feel this conversation is important, but collaborations and listening skills right now um, are very important. Amazing, thank you. Hussein, did you wanna add anything? Your own experiences? Sure, wow, I'm just sitting here thinking how, how I can be a better listener, you know? Um, so easy even in being a, a marginalized voice because of color or because of religion. You know, when, when, I'm, when I hear language from conductors who love Ola Yelo's texts, pieces that talk about the Northern Lights but use Latin Christian text, um, who love to perform Handel's Messiah, who, uh, you know, love the sound of a Bach chorale, come and tell me that my music is too religious because I've incorporated a Muslim theme. It causes me great uh, tension and it, it, uh, it puts a somebody else's expectation of how they want to see me and how they want to define me, restrict me and narrow who I am as a so-called religious person that's separate from their musical life. It almost reminds me of this notion within the Muslim world, and there are it's a, it's a debate across the Muslim world, and it has been a centuries long debate of the role of music. Um, there's this idea that music is haram or forbidden, and then there's certain music there's that's halal or accepted. And uh, the what I understand about the role of music in Islam, for example, is that it has played an essential role in being a source of spiritual enlightenment, bringing people together, inspiring ethical and moral uh, action. And so, you know, to be told that my music is too religious, coming from somebody who loves so-called religious music, or now that we call it art music because it's choral art, or, or telling me that my music isn't advanced enough because it's folk music. It really causes this sort of, are you, it feels like someone is telling me my music is forbidden. And it was told to me that you can't do that particular thing in this particular space because um, there's no, that's not where, what should happen here, for example. And so this whole idea of um, retranslating myself as a subject of my own story, um, I guess it's coming from post-colonial ideas um, I, I love the idea of a, a, an author named uh, Robert C. Young, who says that for a marginalized voice to have agency, they not only have to retranslate themselves as subjects of their own stories, but they also have to retranslate the system that negates them. And that process, which is a lifelong long-term process, a creative and experimental process in my mind, is one that will engender and grow a sense of confidence and strength and ability to participate fully in the world. And I love this idea because it doesn't, it doesn't throw uh, choral music out the door, right? I'm not someone who's interested in saying, we gotta get rid of the system but rather to say, what are the strengths of the system? What has choral music, what's choral music really good at? One of the things for me, and I know we will all agree, is feeling of connection and the transcendence and the goosebumps and the emotional quality of the community. All of those are really powerful uh, impacts of choral music. But what are some of the strengths in, in uh, what, let's say tools that choral music has. For me, for example, I love singing in harmony. My tradition doesn't come from one that we sing in harmony. We sing together in unison in congregation and we hear overtones, or at least I, I hear overtones because that's what I was taught in high school when my teacher said, the angels are singing with you and you hear the overtones. I hear those. And of course you have the people who are singing out of tune, but actually, 
on a third or a fifth uh, or even an, an octave sometimes um, that create this really cool effect in the room. So for me, it's more about how do we find the tools and harness the strengths of the dominant cultural traditions? And also, how do we harness the tools from the diverse traditions that we live in and around that we can then combine and together find new musics, new spaces, new kinds of ways of engaging each other? And what does that look like? I've always had a uh, a struggle with the word decolonization because I don't, I'm not an expert in that. And it's tied so much to certain uh, aspects of culture in, in Canada that I don't know much about as, as, uh, and there will be lots to learn about. But what, what I'm challenged by with this word is that sometimes it becomes oppositional, right? I'm standing against, I wanna bring down, I wanna challenge. But my faith has taught me and my, my family has taught me, it's not about that. Choir has taught me, it's about bringing voices together. So I'm more interested in saying, how can we work together? How can we find those uh, shared harbors and eddies, the in-between spaces where we can harness the strengths of each cultural uh, uh, tradition, musical tradition, uh, religious tradition, whatever it may be, uh, institutional structures, find the strengths, bring them together, and then ask the question, how does this serve the community? So for example, choral music helped me feel empowered and unified, and I felt a spiritual strength that resonated with my own esoteric traditions. And and then I had to do my own work because the choir never asked me what my struggles were. As a young Muslim growing up in Canada, I didn't connect with my traditions in the way my parents did or my grandparents did. They were in different languages. They were, um, they were in a different musical culture. So, and I had to struggle in a world where there's a lot of Islamophobia and negative representation of Islam. I'm constantly asking, how am I going to retranslate myself? How am I going to re-narrate a new story of Islam? What does that sound like? What does that look like? And so I wish my conductor at school had given me the opportunity to say, great, you've had this great musical experience. How do we help you to meet some of the struggles that you have when you walk out this door? When you walk out the choir class, we know you're still going to be faced with X, Y, Z uh, issues that are conflicting, that are creating tension and fragmenting your sense of mental health and physical health. How do we help? So that's my question is how, does, how do we evolve and transform the musical uh, form that we love in a way that can truly meet the needs and help people to meet the needs that they have, not the needs that we think they have or the, thing, the needs that we think we want but what they need. Um, and so that's some, those are some of the thoughts and questions that I have about how to move forward. And I know we, we are all here to do that and I'm excited about where we'll go in the future. That's great. And I think that's a great place to sort of move on from is what, how, what can we do with our own organizations to start addressing those questions? And, you know, I wrote down for myself here, sort of like, what do we keep? What do we, uh, what do we throw away? And what do we add to our, what we're already doing? Because, you know, I think what we've all agreed is that it's not about just throwing out everything that exists already. It's about broadening how we think about that. And so if any of you have any ideas that you'd like to add to that, I'd love to hear your thoughts and have a bit of a discussion on that. I think um, both Hussein and Andrew touched on the word decolonization and the heaviness of it and the, the uncertainty of feeling this word, but at the same time, um, I was saying in our pre-meeting is that if the word decolonization choir, decolonizing choir wasn't used on this poster and was used, let's say, creating a more diverse choir or uh, creating a culturally responsive choir, um, 
we might not put in so much weight in our reflection and thinking about this. We all think that we are already doing it. We all, I mean, all of you are here on a, on a Thursday evening in our time or afternoon uh, to be in this conversation. So you are already people that are very mindful of creating this cultural responsiveness. Um, but, but I think, you know, chiming into that weight of the decolonization word is that that word really got me at least <laughs> really thinking hard the last couple of weeks and i tend to be one that is uh practical and i want to think about okay what to do now and it might seem like oversimplifying um, a very big project but i like to go down to bite-sized pieces into ways and tangible ways that I can work on. Um, so start talking about repertoire, for example. As simple as it sounds like, I am thinking about the five Ws and the one H, but a lot more Ws and a lot more H. <laughs> um, how, how did this piece of music come about? Every single repertoire that you get in your hands, think about how do you first find out about it? Why was this piece of music written? how did it get into your hand where does it come from um, where are we going to be performing it is it suitable performing in a church just because it's a, a beautiful acoustic or is it supposed to be in a place that is truly more inclusive and cultivates uh, an atmosphere that can encourage discussion like this one um, really uh, interrogate that foundation and the basic um, and building that foundation of what are we doing? Why are we doing this piece of music? Doing our homework, uh, right? So again, it might seem like oversimplifying it, but I think starting by that, just asking a lot of questions, why are you programming that piece of music um, is a good start in terms of the repertoire part. I, I actually just like Elaine, actually, what you just said in terms of even venues, um, you know, where we perform. And I know that, you know, in Winnipeg, uh, you know, Winnipeg has, has the second largest Indigenous population in the country after Vancouver. Um, and you know, we've been doing um, a series called our Truth and Reconciliation series. Uh, we do one concert uh, a year where we take a subject like captive or word taken or uh, or fallen, and we'll have three different uh, indigenous composers write a, a piece based on that, on that one word. And we'd like to think that we give them safe and, and uh, respectful places to, uh, as a platform. But it's become, uh, become a lot in the last couple of years talking about where are the indigenous people? And this is very naive, it's like, you know, because the board sometimes, where's our indigenous audience? How, how come they're not coming to this? And then my realization and that just came two years ago it's like well this piece is not for indigenous people it's you know it's it, it's it's for non-indigenous people i wrote a piece called take the indian um back in 2012 which is very harsh and it's really not it, it would be so triggering for many people that have gone through that experience i would never take it on tour to northern manitoba was you know, or what have you but you know places like churches are triggering for people you know you know it, it's not a safe space for many people for obvious reasons um, but it's also in what you're talking about repertoire as well, is that, you know, every year, and I don't, I don't mean to dish on this piece or, you know, but everybody does Huron Carol. Um, and you know, I've even done an arrangement of it too, but the word Huron is offensive to the, for, 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 for those people, you know, the Wyandotte, you know, they, you know, it's a French, almost derogatory term. Now it's not as bad as the E word for Inuit, but it's, it's almost like that. Um, and I've been seeing a lot of discussions the last couple of years, and I don't mean to just, you know, to, to put anybody down or what have you, but it, it's very important to sort of, just because we've been performing here on Carol for so many years, and you know, it, it's just part of the, the Canadian repertoire um, or the choral repertoire, doesn't mean we have to stop doing it. It's the same thing as, it doesn't mean just because we have statues of Johnny McDonald or Jeffrey Amherst or, you know, you name it. We have to take it down right away and just put it out of the conversation. No, I think that we, these are learning experiences, you know, and I've talked to many co-conductors that have 
like, well, I got to, uh, you know, I, I do the Huron Carol because it's a, it's a popular piece and people love it. It's a part, part of Canadian Christmas repertoire and I have no problem with that personally. But, you know, I just want to give you a perspective of that, 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 that sort of label of these people that were almost entirely wiped out, um, you know, in, in a space of 100 years through disease and, and genocide. And if you look at that, you know, sort of a perspective a little bit more carefully and sensitively, then we can understand, we can build a relationship. I don't want to see monuments of bad people, to, you know, taken down. I want to see the discussion to come up and why, you know, why that person was, you know, like I only, I only have learned about Jeffrey Amherst about a couple of years ago, working on a project, uh, an opera project. I didn't know anything about him, but that, you know, this is the man that actually to, to get rid of the indigenous population in Nova Scotia, uh, infected blankets, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. disease. Sorry, sorry. And I just feel that, like, you know, that's, that's important because most Canadians don't know that. Um, so I think that, you know, in terms of people that know a little bit of, uh, you know, particularly First Nations people that know why Huron is offensive or why Jeffrey Amherst is a bad person or the, you know, the horrible troubles that happened under John A. McDonald's watch and, and particularly on the, on the plains uh, where people were, were dying of starvation is that we just need to sort of help. We just need to sort of like, uh, I don't like to use the word educate because that's kind of like, uh, um, you know, like I'm, I'm not going to educate anybody because I don't have any answers. And, but I feel that there's a lot of knowledge that's out there that we can learn from, from either elders or, you know, my perspective, indigenous perspective, elders, or there are so many uh, educators out there that are indigenous that know the history that's happened on Turtle Island, um, rather than, you know, Eurocentric or uh, Anglo-Saxon textbooks that are sort of talks about John A. Macdonald and the development of this country and the rail system. And I didn't know that there were thousands of, you know, Chinese immigrants that built the rail. I didn't know that at all. You know, like the, the, that we weren't taught that um, in school. And I'm 53. And I, you know, going to school in this country in the 70s was, I didn't know anything about Indigenous people or immigrants or really. So um, I think a lot of it has to do in terms of sort of going back to the repertoire is that we just sort of, why do we, you know, program these pieces? And certainly there are pieces that we don't do anymore. A couple of years ago, I was adjudicating, well, several years ago, I was adjudicating uh, the Winnipeg Music Festival and a choir came up and this is the first time I actually experienced something like this. They did uh, a spiritual called Pick a Bale of Cotton. There's not one person of color in that choir. And I didn't know what to say. They did the, you know, and it's like, I, I, you know, I don't even know what to say right now, but I was kind of like, I felt very uncomfortable. Um, you know, like, what's your experience? Like, you know, I'm, I'd like to think that we're getting rid of that type of uh, approach to so-called gospel music or what have, what have you. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not the person to talk about that, but I felt like, we're getting rid of the inappropriate appropriation in choral music slowly. Uh, it's still out there, particularly in the indigenous world. Um, but also I feel that, you know, we're also getting away from writing indigenous subjects by non-indigenous people. Um, the opera world has been pretty guilty of that, you know, appropriation and racial stereotypes. Um, but, you know, and, and I, I don't mean to pick on anybody, but, you know, when the Louis Riel opera came out, uh, you know, for the 100 sesquintennial, sesquintennial um, and was pre presented at the National Arts Center, it was very offensive to the indigenous people in, that were there for a conference celebrating this 150 year, of years of colonialism. Um, you know, because there was a lot of backslapping and say, well, you did a great job, we included indigenous people. No, you didn't, you, you brought indigenous people on the stage and didn't give them any speaking parts or singing parts. You know, they didn't see the irony <laughs> of, of that statement. You know, and they also, of course, they, you know, they, they appropriated a, a very, very inappropriate sacred song in that performance. So, and then, then they, you know, they say, oh, we learned a lot from this. Like, well, you could have learned a lot if you actually approached the community um, and listened, going back to listening. So, sorry, that was a long-winded thing, but Elaine just actually brought, like, in terms of repertoire and venue, um, I think are important for us to continue um, of course, I love churches because I love early music and the acoustics, but we're rethinking sort of how we do our projects uh, that maybe not Palestrina or Monteverdi or Bach, you know, rethinking that idea. Absolutely. I'll just interject because you were mentioning the Louis Riel opera 
Andrew, and uh, I think we all talked about for a resource for people, there's a relatively recent book by Dylan Robinson called Hungry Listening, which talks about listen, listening and decolonizing how we listen and bring indigenous perspectives to that. And he talks quite a lot about that Louis Riel opera in there as well. And it's a very valuable resource for folks. And we will, um, we will send you guys a resource list after this talk as well with some of what we've talked about and some other great suggestions that our panelists do have. So, I mean, one thing, and I might just progress on here because we talked about maybe like good repertoire, I think is a big question. And so if we're looking perhaps for new repertoire or making new connections with people, what's a, how do we go about making those relationships? And I might just start with Hussein because in our pre-talk, he brought up uh, this great, very concise way to talk about it. You know, he said, commit, consider, consult collaborate and compensate. And I might just turn it over to him to elaborate on that a little bit. Thanks, Nina. Um, so since, since, um, since our, our, uh, our pre uh, uh, panel discussion, that's also, it keeps evolving. And, and it, was, it came out of a conversation with another colleague of mine, Shireen Abu Qadar, who uh, is working in uh, Arabic music and choral music publishing. Um, and so, Nina, what were those words again? You said commit. Muted. Sorry. Commit. Consider. Consider. Consult. Yeah. Collaborate and compensate. Right. Um, so I wanted to add, you know, we could add a lot of C's, but I think one of them would be um, um, curiosity is a really important. Asking questions about what is it that I care about? What are the larger social and human struggles that we face? How can what we do in choir help provide tools and approaches and scaffolds and pathways to actually address these struggles? How can we work with communities to find out what their struggles are and how they need to translate and retranslate themselves? How are they retranslating themselves? What can we learn from that? Who's out there doing this amazing work? And so many of us on this, on this uh, call today uh, who are listening and, and participating are doing such amazing work. And so, you know, what kind of tools do they have? Can we talk to them about working together, sharing those tools? Um, and then asking more questions. What is our music? What, what do I connect with? If you connect with faith, culture, tradition, language, there's more of a sense of ownership that comes from that. So how do we help the choristers make that music their own and help them bridge with their own struggles and lives? And how do their stories get to be told as well? Um, so I would say like curiosity is an important one. Um, commitment, I think commitment is very, very essential. And by commitment, I'm talking about long-term commitment, not just one-offs. I know there are um, instances where I, there was a choir um, that collaborated with an indigenous women's drumming group in Ontario super awesome concert on many levels it was i had a chance to interview some of the young people involved and the the leaders of the various groups very positive experience but the 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 lead drummer from the women's group uh, jan sherman she said if it's not going to be long term we've made the invitation to come and have tea and 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 feast with us and get to know us but if it's not long term then this one-off can be very uh, uh, superficial. Um, how do we commit to learning and experimenting? I like to think of if, uh, if uh, uh, someone from Iran comes to Canada and has to find new ways to preserve their heritage and also to find new contemporary expression for it. We brought our music from uh, Europe, choral music came from Europe to Canada. The, the choral music that is taught in schools, especially, and, and that we've kind of harnessed. So if we were like a Persian tradition coming to Canada and needing to retranslate ourselves, not only preserve, 
but to develop and evolve, what would that look like? That's a long-term commitment. And are we committing to evolving? Are we committing to growing and expanding our practices? Um, and are we willing to just do something, no matter how scared we feel? Let's commit, do something. If you genuinely seek to understand and try to figure out how this diversity of knowledge can bubble and thrive and cultivate a creative environment for all of us to exist in, then that, was, that would be amazing to me. Um, consult. I think we, you know, many of us are starting to do that. Consult with a variety of people. Um, you know, if you're in a community where you want to consult with a Muslim uh, group, for example, also know that there are many interpretations of Islam that appear in multiple diverse cultural vernaculars and contemporary expression. So if you talk to the imam of a certain kind of uh, interpretation of faith and, and, uh, and way of being, that was, is not gonna always get you the same response as if you talk to someone who is a young person, who's a media artist, who's really uh, figuring out how to be Muslim and social, uh, socially conscious in the world. Um, so it's not just that if you go to one person and they say, no, that's not possible. Or if you go to another person who says, yes, that is possible. Um, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot more in there. So con consulting with people, the right people, that the people with values whom you find you share, um, who can be open and curious with you. Um, that I think these are all important in cons consultation with the knowledge keepers, with the musicians and scholars, with your community elders. When I, can, when I did the Ismaili Youth Choir, I had to go to community elders to say, okay, I'm thinking about doing this. What about, how can I do it? And so there would be a discussion. And so, as I said, I know many of you are doing that, but um, you know, I think it's just an important thing. Commit, uh, be curious, consult, and then I think collaboration is, uh, is something that's really excited me, a collaboration with diverse musicians, um, you know, even searching. So when I was looking for, believe it or not, I was looking for music for the Ismaili Youth Choir in Canada. I found that the Vienna Boys Choir did a whole concert on the Silk Route and they had arrangements of Central Asian folk songs. So, I was able to get an arrangement of that. And then I was able to collaborate with um, a Hindustani musician who is of Afghan descent, who was able to prepare the choir to sing an introduction that was like an alap in the musical tradition of, of India and Central Asia that then connected with that. And then I worked with and connected with uh, community members um, within the Ismaili tradition who could actually help to under, help me understand that text and the context of it. So collaboration happens on so many levels. Co-creation, I love co-creation in your choirs. Opportunities to do round circle singing, opportunities to improvise, opportunities to co-create. Um, I had a group called the Awaz Ensemble um, that is a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi musical, multi-religious group who came together, people who read music and not read music, and we developed a choral composition through co-creation. That's a whole world that we can open ourselves up to. And then lastly, I think sharing knowledge and tools. And I think what's really important is compensation. Um, it's often, you know, there's this sense that, oh, you're, you're a Muslim uh, person and you'll want to share your tradition and religion and culture with us. So you'll want to do it for, for free, you know, as part of your service. I'm like, that doesn't always work. Um, you know, you can't, rec you can't always accept that a culture bearer will be willing to serve um, because we also have to serve ourselves and our, our physical material needs. So I think offering, you know, compensations, compensation is, is really, really important. And I would bring that into the five, five or six C's that we have because, um, and fair composition, compensation, I think is, is, is important to uh, an equal compensation. So if you're paying 
for artist X, $400 to do a workshop, then artist Y should get the same thing. Not artist Y should get less because of whatever other reason, right? So we know this and I'm not sharing anything new, but I think that's an important piece that I'd like to uh, wrap up with. So commit, be curious, commit, consult, collaborate and compensate, which would, which would be some of the things that have excited me in this record. That's great. It's a great and easy way to remember it. And I think we may have talked about this in our pre-talk, but this idea, I think Andrew mentioned this as well, of sometimes these one-off collaborations or, you know, programming one Indigenous piece on your program in one season and checking the box is not, is not necessarily enough, that it's more about creating these longer term connections and collaborations. We are, sorry, go ahead, Melissa. Oh, I, I don't, I'm not sure, I'm not aware of the time here, but uh, <laughs> I just wanted to, to say, um, you know, I'm so grateful for everything that all of my colleagues are saying uh, here on the call today and everything that they are saying, I agree with 100%. Um, and I, I really believe uh, that our choirs are a reflection of us. Uh, that's, you know, something that I've, I've been, taught and I know to be true that uh, everything about my choir is really a reflection of me and who I am. And so with that understanding, uh, I think it's really important that as choral directors, we be very brutally honest about who we are. Uh, we really take time to evaluate ourselves and understand that uh, we have to position ourselves as a leader, a uh, role model, uh, and uh, understand that uh, our identity um, is going to inform uh, the way that we go about working with our ensembles. And so we have to look at who is in our choir, uh, what is going on in our society, and, uh, and talk to our students. And, and as everybody else mentioned, talk, reach out to people in our community. Um, I, I have one, one thing that popped up in my email just this morning, uh, and I thought, oh, if I get the opportunity, I'll share this. And it was a, a short article from the um, ACDA Ohio chapter. Um, I, somehow I got on the mailing list. <laughs> and, uh, but there was a teacher who wrote that, uh, you know, she'd always been thinking of herself as a person who uh, was always being aware of access, equity, diversion, inclusion, and was doing her best to make sure that she was uh, including everybody, being as diverse as possible in her repertoire. And she said an incident happened uh, at the school where she was teaching, where a, a young Black uh, man was shot, and the students, uh, they wanted to sing. They wanted to sing a song about it. And they brought to her, uh, it was a rap song that they brought to her. And she thought, she listened to the song and she thought to herself, we cannot sing this. <laughs> she said, you know, all of the reasons, she had all of the right reasons. The language was inappropriate. Like, you know, this didn't work, that didn't work. She had all of the reasons as to why. And uh, she had to go back and say to herself, but wait, I'm, I'm this person that wants to be inclusive, diverse. I wanna, I wanna have equity, equality, and these students are passionate about this. And this is a situation where, you know, they are deeply affected, our whole community is affected. And what, what can I do to reach out to these students to, to, to have them be included, um, and, but to also, you know, um, be the educator that, that I, I, I want to be. So, so she decided, that she would ask the students to rewrite the words. Uh, they would use the same melody. And she, uh, so again, kind of taking the idea Hussein just said, a collaborative piece, getting the kids, you know, and then she posted uh, that the words that the original words and then the new words that the students wrote. And she said, she, she kind of threw that out there because she didn't think that they would, uh, that they would actually go for it and, and do it. But these students were committed. And it really meant so much to them. And then she reached out to musicians within the community. Um, she was able to um, listen and by ear 
uh, write out a melody and, and teach the students and, and put a song together. And she said it was, it was so meaningful on so many levels. The students, even herself changed. So uh, we as educators have, we have to look at ourselves and look at, you know, I, I, for myself, I, I probably would have said, forget it, you know, like, well, I'll find something else that will reflect, you know, what has happened in the community. But we, we have to break down these hierarchies, as we talked about, we, we have to be open, we have to look at who is in front of us, and then really understand, I know who I am, how can I serve you? What we do is a service. And uh, and when, when we kind of are able to wrap our minds around that, then, then we can change the world. And uh, so, so that, that's all I, ha I don't have anything, you know, <laughs> miraculous to add to what everybody has said, but I, I thought I would share that. And I can share that, the link, the article, if people are interested, for sure. Melissa, I just want to piggyback uh, with what you said, and that was such a powerful uh, story that you have shared as well. And I see, I see that there is a link on our chat. Um, but yes, looking inward, and I have one um, circle in my notes modeling um, for our students or chorister, uh, however age group, whatever age group or choirs are. Uh, us conductors already wear so many hats as conductors or choir leaders. Uh, we're often the artistic director, we're the administrator, we're the person that sweep the floor for rehearsal spaces. Um, we're educators, but at the same time, we're also learners and listeners. And one thing to add is we're community organizers. And when it comes to decolonizing, this is a big project. It's a big project that feels like there's no end in sight. It's just one foot in front of each, each other, one another, and keep going at it. Um, you know, it is not something that we can do it on our own, even though us conductors might be very used to being hands on and do everything on our own. At the end of the day, I think the powers comes from the people and people are the ones who drive this change. And as community organizers, if we can collectively cultivate an environment that encourages these kinds of conversations, encourage active listening and cultural responsiveness and teaching and learning from one another and can be more intentional in creating this environment, you know, we have a little bit more um, luck in putting that effort into tackling this really big project together because we cannot do it to, uh, by ourselves. We have to drive this awareness as a community within our own choirs community and also within the choral community, which um, what we're doing here today is, is one step of that as well. So yeah, just piggybacking on what, what you said there, Melissa, is, you know, I, th I think it's very important for us to look inward and reflect um, as ourselves, as artists, and then how do we model that for all the groups that we're involved with as well? And how do we be a listener and learner at the same time as we lead? Thank you, all of you. That was wonderful. We have about 10 minutes left, so I'm just going to turn this over. Uh, I have a couple of the questions that were pre-submitted, and I'll ask them, and feel free to take this as a free-for-all and jump in as you like. And if people do have questions that they want to put in the chat, we can also try and get to a couple of those. So these are questions that people submitted with their registration. I have maybe edited these down a little bit. Some of these I think we've kind of already talked about. So one of the questions was, can the choral tradition, which has roots in Western and religious music, really be decolonized? And I feel like we've kind of said yes at this point, unless anybody would disagree with that. We'll move on. This one is interesting. So what does choral singing look like this century? How do we look around the world and forward rather than just back? How do we sing music from around the world without appropriating? I think going back, sorry, oh, sorry Melissa. Um, I think going back to our 
our practical uh, breakdown, uh, asking a lot of questions about the repertoire is a great one. And what Hussein said about um, collaborating and bringing in the knowledge keepers, bringing in the specialists, carving out uh, budgets in your administrative structure to invite these specialists to come in. But one important thing that I want to bring back to what Andrew said is let uh, listen to what these knowledge keepers have to say. And if you're commissioning someone to write a piece of music, listen to what they have to say and what, and instead of just telling them what you want to hear. Um, so I think that is, that's my take of uh, what we have kind of brought in and just a quick little summary of, of that question. Melissa? I, I was just gonna say, and I think this might address the first question, uh, Nina, that you read. But uh, Andrew so eloquently said, you know, the, the whole decolonizing, sh should we completely, you know, throw out absolutely everything? No, uh, and I agree with him. No, we should not. Um, because these are opportunities for us to, to learn uh, and to do better. Uh, and also opportunities for us to say, as Andrew said, there are Indigenous composers that are coming up that are wonderful. So we need to find out who they are and commission them. There are, you know, composers from all over the world that are doing some wonderful things. So we need to commission them and then perform their works. And again, use that as an opportunity to learn, to listen, to collaborate, and all of the wonderful things, the six C's that Hussein uh, mentioned before. Um, so uh, we're, I, I forget the second question, something about bringing uh, choral music. Uh, could you repeat that question? I'm sorry. Yeah, what, what does choral music look like in this century and how do we bring in a more uh, global or I guess diverse perspective without appropriating? Um, and this, this is not information that, you know, I, I know uh, or that I've studied, but there's a really wonderful uh, conductor from the States, Dr. Rollo Dilworth, who has uh, some wonderful sessions online through Course America. Brock University had him yesterday give a session, which I think is gonna be open to or is open to the public. But he, he mentions that scholars, you know, uh, theorists say that we cannot, we cannot avoid appropriation unless you remain in your own bubble and you've never witnessed anything by a different culture. You've never worn, you know, garments, jewelry, eaten food uh, by another culture, you are experiencing a level of appropriation. And we are, we are very quick uh, in our choral world to say, X A, like we cannot perform this or that, or, you know, what have you, or, uh, you know, it's not appropriate for me to do this. We, we are so afraid uh, to step out of what is um, comfortable, normal for us, uh, but, but, uh, I've, I've also said, you know, I don't know of any uh, person who has arranged a uh, spiritual and then placed, you know, in the, in the liner notes that this is only for a certain person to perform. Uh, all people, uh, it's, it, it's music, it's art, it's for you to perform, but you have to do the work. So the same way that you, at the beginning of the year, lay out your scores and you say, you know, uh, this year I'd love to do some Bach, or I'd love to do, just have a, a pile that's equal, uh, that you equate a, a great standard, uh, wonderful quality music with uh, some of the other music, and then you take the time. Well, when I prepare uh, a choral piece in Austro-Germanic Latin, I have to take the time to understand you know, how to say everything, to get the IPA, to understand the background. So then that, that means I have to do the same for music outside of my culture uh, and even music within my own culture. Spirituals, I have to do the same. I have to do the work. So, um, and listening is part of doing the work. Collaborating is part of doing the work. Doing the research, the, the questions that Elaine asked, the who, the how, the what, the where, the when, we, we must know those things. We have, to, we, have to, we have to do our research. And as long life learners, we should, we should love to do those things. That should excite us. That should, should make us, uh, you know, so, so I guess moving forward for choral music, what does it look like? 
it, it looks beautiful. It looks awesome the same way that it does now. It just has, you know, a, a variety of colors, more palettes, more tones, more scales, more, more everything. Um, uh, that, that's, that's all how I would answer that, that question. That's great. Thank you. So we are almost at the end here. So I'll, I'll just wrap things up and then ask each of our panelists if they'd like to add anything just as closing remarks. So I will mention that, as we said, our panelists have been very generous and sent me a lot of fantastic resources, which I will compile and send out to everybody who registered for this so that you can use that in your own work going forward. I would like to thank our panelists tremendously for being here. And as they said, this is difficult and, you know, they were all reluctant initially, but I think they have so much wisdom to give and so openly. So we deeply appreciate that. And I would just, I'll, from my end, I'll just finish with this uh, sort of definition or description of decolonizing that I like, which is from a local Squamish um, woman. Her name's Tatalia Michelle Nahani. She has some great resources online as well that I will share with you. And what she wrote is this. She wrote, decolonizing is a lot like the word healing. It is different for everybody every day. There is no final end point and it's not easy. Nobody knows exactly what it looks like, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't work towards achieving it. And I know for me, that was very transformative to hear that and to say, right, I just have to start putting one foot ahead of the other, as we said, and just keep making those steps. So I'll just maybe go around the circle again if everyone has a little anything to wrap up with. Elaine? Uh, I love that quote, Nina, and <laughs> reading it a week ago and reading it today was already different. And I'm excited to keep revisiting a quote like that and revisiting conversations like this. Um, I just want to say, and I think this kind of addressed a little bit of uh, that two questions we had a little bit earlier is we have, we choral leaders have been flexible. I mean, hey, we have been so flexible that we are able to make it work in the pandemic world and teach choral music virtually, which is, you know, I still don't know how we're doing it, but we're doing it. So uh, we can definitely be flexible and create space to be culturally responsive and create space to encourage these kind of dialogue. Uh, we have already created spaces for excellency and humanity uh, to exist together and why not actively and intentionally make space for inclusivity as well. So that's what I would like to end with. And thank you, it's such an honor thank to you. be here. Great, Melissa, anything? I agree. It's an honor to be here and to have these conversations. I would just uh, encourage everybody uh, to know we are not an island unto ourselves. So reach out, ask questions, and it may not be perfect, and that's okay. You might have backlash, uh, but get into good trouble. That uh, American senator, civil rights leader uh, said, jo uh, John Lewis, I think, uh, said, get, get in good, good trouble, necessary trouble, and redeem the soul of, well, he said America, but we could say uh, the choral arts. Uh, I'm hopeful that choral art musicians can lead the way when it comes to including access, diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is a lifelong process. It's not going to happen overnight, but if anybody can do it, choral musicians can do it. Amazing. Thank you. Andrew. Well, this has been so inspirational. Like, honestly, like uh, my my head's going to be swimming with what I've heard thus far. Um, and it, it, it's my ADD kicking in because I have all the comments coming in and I'm just like, I can't respond at the same time. But, um, you know, in terms of like, if we were at a conference, of course, like, you know, in the old days, people would, would be able to go and, and meet people that are, you know, and, and, and make the connections. And so this is, I guess, the next best, best thing. But um, I would suggest if you want to get a hold of me or whatever, Nina's got my email or, or, or for probably all of us. But um, I, I guess the last thing I'd have to say is that um, we are, these are great steps. Um, this conversation could go on for hours or days or weeks or even years. Um, but I just feel so uh, honored to be in on this panel with the, 
with Elaine and Melissa and Hossein and just the way that I'm proud of our choral community. Um, I'm proud of the voices that are being heard now. I'm proud that we are working towards a collective um, awareness. Um, and I always say like this many times, you know, particularly from an indigenous perspective, rec reconciliation is not a destination. It is an ongoing journey. So as long as we can sort of like realize that, that we're not going to have, you know, uh, commissions and government committees and that are going to be able to like solve our problems. No, they, they won't solve our problems. We will help bring awareness to this in the arts and the choral and ballet and theater, you name it. Um, you know, and, and I just love this idea of being able to continue the work. And I would say a call out to anybody that's part of the podium 2022, we should get to con con continue this discussion for the next podium um, when we can get back together again, because I think this is the, the most vital issue in the Canadian coral scene right now is we need to continue this going, not just in Zooms, but we can get back together. We can do this in person and we can continue this because this is gonna take some time. But I look forward to that next podium where we can be together um, and uh, work together and listen together and respect each other together. Um, and, and music is a medicine. So let's keep on taking it. Chimigwich. Thank you. I do believe Megan from Coral Canada is on here. So she's heard you. <laughs> Who's saying? <laughs> well, I echo um, everything you have all said, Elaine, uh, Nina, Melissa. Andrew, I'm honored to be here and humbled because, uh, wow, you know, uh, like Nina said, <laughs> I was definitely uncomfortable to be on a panel about decolonizing. Um, but I want to just do a shout out to all of you out there, my colleagues um, at U of T, um, all my colleagues in Vancouver that I know and across Canada. It's because of your knowledge and because of your openness and willingness to share what you've learned in your life and be so generous with that that i've become who i am today and choral music for me has been a vital energy source to remind me of my spiritual heritage my common heritage with all creation and I believe that if we can hold that and find new ways to amplify that in, in different colors, in kaleidoscopes of soundscapes that can create conditions for more people to be able to hear themselves in a reconciled and healed kind of way in whatever that means for them, then we have such a powerful, um, uh, a privilege and role to play to bring those voices together and and I too am so proud of what we've achieved and how we've we've fostered and I've heard uh, the late Diane Loomer use the word ministry <laughs> um, mm -hmm. you know and I use that in a very broad sense but uh, this this field of knowledge has been very much a ministry for me and helped me uh, come into myself and know who I am deeply. And so for that, I just want to say thank you. And I look forward to working with all of you in magical ways that we can develop uh, with our communities to create safer spaces for more people. Thank you, Hussein, and thank you all of our panels. You, I mean, this, I'm honored that you all came here and were willing to undertake this conversation and share everything. This was great for me to just sit and listen. And we look forward to continuing this conversation and continuing our work as in the future. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Good night.